Hey everyone, and um, although it's rather cool down here in Cape Town this evening, and uh, indeed even in Mauritius, uh, Nikki and I were chatting earlier, and apparently she had a, a really chilly 22 degrees uh, today, which obviously for Mauritius is, uh, is quite down, so she's enjoying a little bit of her winter. Um, but yeah, between uh, myself and Nikki and, and Lev, uh, we'd like to bring you some warm greetings, and uh, we want to say thank you again for joining us for another interesting Dream Destination webinar. Uh, this time we head off to Guyana, a country that's always fascinated me since childhood, really. Um, I'm a huge cricket fan, and it was uh, always on my radar because it's one of these regions that make up the cricketing nation of the West Indies. It's kind of always been, been there in the background. But from a birding point of view, however, Guyana has a whole lot to offer and uh, particularly attractive given the vast expanses of intact habitat, small human population, and just downright holding some outrageous birds. I won't go into any detail on that front, however, as Lev will be entertaining you shortly on that side of things. Speaking of Lev, there's no better time to introduce him than right now. For many of you, Lev will be a familiar face having presented twice already since our webinar started, firstly with Mexico back in August last year, and then in January when Lev wowed us with Canada's fabulous owls. For those of you who don't know Lev, he resides in Canada, but was actually born in St. Petersburg, Russia. He's a keen interest in all forms of wildlife that began with looking for insects at the family cottage near the Finnish border when he was a young boy. And he started working as a ranger in one of Canada's most famous parks, Algonquin, shortly after finishing high school, where he spent nearly a decade educating thousands of visitors about the various aspects of the park's ecology, as well as maintaining and contributing to the extensive collection of records and specimens in the archives. Lev also led our last Guyana tour before the pandemic struck back in November 2019 and is really looking forward to sharing his knowledge and love for this incredible South American destination. Well we're pretty much ready to get underway but uh, just a reminder that we always love fielding your questions so if you do have a question or just want to say hi please use the chat function or the Q&A box and uh, we'll have a questions and answers session at the end as we always do, um, and this time with Nikki and Lev. So on that note, the virtual floor is all yours, Lev. All right, thanks so much you guys. And uh, it's good to be back uh, doing webinars and uh, talking about birds. I had a, a fairly not birdy summer. I haven't, uh, haven't been doing too much birding. Um, just doing some work here and there. So it's it's good to be back looking at pictures of, of, of birds and, and talking about them, uh, certainly in a country as, uh, as amazing as uh, Guyana. So thank you. And thank you to all the viewers that have taken the time out of their day to uh, sit and watch me talk about birds. So we'll, uh, we'll get right into it here. And uh, oops, there we go. Um, so for those who might not know where Guyana is located, it's uh, in Northern Central America. I've got it outlined here in, uh, in the red um, line. So to the west, it is bordered by Venezuela, all right, and Brazil to the south and the southwest, and to the east uh, by Suriname, okay? You can see it's, uh, there's a really big green chunk, which we'll uh, have a look at uh, a couple more slides there. A couple of uh, interesting and relevant facts uh, about the country from just a general interest and a birding perspective. So just under 800,000 people, but 90% of those people live along this 20 or 30 kilometer stretch uh, of coast near sort of the, the Georgetown area, which is the capital. Um, this makes it the second least populated country uh, in the entire continent. And that also means that over 70% of the country uh, is undeveloped. So it's not, uh, there's no, um, deforestation that occurs in that area. There's some mining that's been popping up here and there, but largely it is uh, pristine um, primary rainforest. Okay, so there's this forest landscape integrity index. Uh, it's what essentially what it does is it um, has a look at the amount of anthropogenic um, effects on a country's uh, forested areas. Um, Guyana has a very high score, 9.58. Um, comparing it to, for example, the Vatican City, which has a score of zero because there is no native forest left there, um, it is a very, very high score, one of the highest scoring uh, of any country in the world. Um, for folks who are traveling to Guyana from an English-speaking region, um, the official language is English. It's, it's a dialect of English. It's uh, Guyanese uh, Creole. Um, but 
most people there um, speak fluent English and understand English. So it's uh, easy for folks to get around, of course, um, if English is your primary language. Uh, there are nine indigenous tribes that call the country home. Um, actually, many of the lodges that we stay at, or all of the lodges in the interior, are run by indigenous communities. So that, um, in combination with the fact that a lot of these folks speak uh, English in addition to their to their mother tongue, um, it gives a really interesting opportunity for uh, for folks to sort of chat with these people and see uh, how they live out there and uh, learn a bunch of very interesting things and just hang out with these folks on your free time. Uh, and see how, how that works and how people live down there in the forest, which to me is uh, just as fascinating as the birding sometimes. So uh, it is a, a pretty unique opportunity, uh, definitely, uh, to, to interact with those folks. And uh, from a birding perspective and from a naturalist perspective, uh, the stats that we really like to see are those uh, numbers of species, of course. And uh, there's approximately 800 species of birds that have been recorded um, in the country. Uh, it's very underbirded, uh, especially the sort of northwestern area, which borders on Venezuela. Okay, so there are likely many more species um, present in the country. There's just a lack of surveying. Uh, new species for the country are still being discovered. Um, we'll talk about some of them later in the presentation. Uh, very high mammal diversity, 225. This includes um, fairly common to abundant in some places, large mammals, including uh, jaguar, sort of a keystone, keystone species, uh, white-lipped peccary, sort of lar large herd creature that needs big tracts of primary forest, uh, and so on and so forth. Of course, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards uh, the end of the presentation. Lots of reptiles and amphibians, 176, 148, respectively. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of those two groups of animals. I know not everybody is, um, but uh, I will touch up on them a little bit later on in the presentation as well. So uh, this is a satellite image of uh, that picture that I showed you earlier, and you could see that there is a great big blob of green. So this is truly undeveloped um, forest. It's this gigantic tract. You can see Suriname and French Guiana also share big, uh, big chunks of undeveloped forest. This makes it excellent for seeing certain species that need this sort of um, forest to survive, whether it be mammals or birds. Um, it's an excellent place uh, to see some of these things. And if you like endemics, and who doesn't if you're a birder, um, there is a Precambrian pre -Cambrian feature, the Guyana shield, which um, is an instigator of endemism. Uh, you can see it here, um, big sort of chunk there goes through Venezuela and the higher portions of the Guyana shield. There are these um, very distinctive flat topped mountains called Tepui which uh, contain several endemics in their own right. Some of them creep into Guyana a little bit. Most of them are in Venezuela. Um, but there's also a high degree of endemism uh, throughout this sort of shield area. So there are quite a few special birds to be found in the country. And Guyana, for a lot of these places, for a lot of these species, is uh, some of the best sort of country to see these birds uh, in the world. So We'll start our tour, uh, our little virtual tour there in Georgetown, which is where all of our tours begin. Okay, this is the sort of the capital area, quite highly developed, um, you know, big big town. But um, before we go into the interior, there's also a strip of habitat uh, along the coast there that goes uh, into Suriname and French Guiana a little bit that holds quite a few endemic species. Okay, one of them is the Rufus crab hawk. A uh, lovely bird. Uh, it is quite uh, quite brightly colored. Um, it's uh, one of the black hawks, so it's closely related to great black hawk in them. And uh, it lives in this mangrove uh, coastal strip, um, an endangered uh, species, an imperiled species anyway. Its habitat is uh, is at risk in some some areas, but we do have very good chances of seeing it. We've seen it, I think, on every single trip. And um, often we get to see them catching fish, which is very cool. And they'll also eat shellfish as well. This is one that uh, a lot of folks come to Guyana to see, the blood-colored woodpecker, uh, very well named. It's, uh, it's, it's a Vanilliornis, it's a small woodpecker, um, but it's quite common uh, even in the botanical gardens at Georgetown, which uh, is an excellent place to, to look for birds and somewhere we'll, uh, where we'll check for sure. White-bellied piculate, another endemic of this, uh, of this area. There's a taxonomic uh, debate going on with populations of these birds. It might be endemic, there's a couple of populations elsewhere. I think the chances are good for uh, a couple of splits there. 
but it's another bird that we look for in these in this coastal strip. Scarlet ibis, not an endemic, but a spectacular bird that is very common here in, um, in mud flats and uh, sandy areas along the coast. We'll be sure to see many of them flying around and sitting near the mangrove areas, feeding on fiddler crabs and other small invertebrates. Parrots are surprisingly common, even in the, um, in the botanical gardens in Georgetown itself. So this is a species that's less common, uh, less common to see very well. Um, festive Amazon, uh, which is uh, readily seen in the botanical gardens, and also the ridiculous red fan parrot. Um, so this is a parrot that uh, is very hawk-like, actually one of the, the um, sort of in the captive bird trade, they're sometimes called hawk head parrots. And uh, they do look similar to a hawk. You can't really see it in this picture, but they have a long tail. Uh, and the flight profile is very occipiter-like. They have sort of stiff wing beats. But really, the defining feature of the red fan parrot is the red fan. They have this big red and uh, sort of iridescent blue crest that they erect. Um, and you can see them throughout the tour, but uh, starting right at the botanical gardens in Georgetown. So very, very cool. And lots of birding to be had right out of the gate. Toko toucan, the largest toucan in the world. It's not particularly common, but there are chances to see it uh, in the botanical gardens there at Georgetown. Very, very large bird. Um, this is a bird that might be becoming more common in certain areas because of deforestation. Uh, it really likes that sort of second growth um, for robbing nests and feeding on fruit. And of course, there's always a, a few surprises. A great horned owl for those listeners um, listening from the US or Canada, a common widespread bird in, in North America. Um, in South America, it exists as well. This is one that we saw in the Georgetown Botanical Garden. It might be a little bit strange to see these uh, getting mobbed by blood-colored woodpeckers or red fan parrots, but uh, it does happen. And uh, yeah, just another interesting uh, facet of, of birding out here. One of the highlights uh, of our time uh, around the Georgetown is a boat trip uh, down the Mahaika River. So one of several boat trips on the tour. And uh, of course, the highlight for many folks is uh, the Hawatsin. So Hawatsin are very, very strange. All right, they are exclusively herbivorous. One of the very few uh, birds that eats just leaves and uh, not much else at all. As a result, they're kind of big and bulky. They have a, a big uh, sort of digestive tract that uh, facilitates uh, the digestion of these leaves. Um, but they're also very bizarre in the fact that uh, they're young um, which some folks may be familiar with. They have these claws when they first come out of the egg. And this is a bird that's associated with water courses and their nests are fairly flimsy and they often build them over water. So the young sometimes fall out of the nest. Um, they're accomplished swimmers, which again is, uh, is pretty remarkable, but they also use these claws to sort of climb up, uh, climb up branches and back into their nest or at least the area around their nest. Uh, so they are fascinating to see. It's a widespread bird, um, but this is a good place to see it. And um, we were lucky enough to actually see a nest. Um, couldn't see the little, the claws and the babies though. They were too small and they were in the nest, uh, not easily seen, but uh, yeah, certainly excellent opportunity to see it um, here on the Mahaika River and elsewhere along the trip. Greater Ani, this is another species that's quite widespread throughout South America, but uh, again, a spectacular bird, very large. Uh, if the sun hits it just right, you see the, the beautiful sort of unbroken blue and purple iridescence on the wings and tail, and the big pale eye, of course, stands out. And Donacobius, um, another interesting bird. You know, it doesn't look like anything in particular, but uh, it has a very um, fascinating social structure. They sort of mate for life. They have uh, helpers that help them raise their young from previous generations. They also have these prairie chicken like um, sacks that they inflate when they're uh, when they're calling. They usually call in a duet and um, their taxonomy is very very bizarre. They apparently are most closely related to acrocephalus to uh, like river warblers from the old world okay? which is um, really far-fetched considering that they're nowhere near uh, where those birds exist and they're the only member of, uh, of their family. So for family listers that might be an attractive thing. Um, and it's another species that's quite widespread, but we do have uh, very good chances of seeing it very well um, on, uh, on the Mahaika River there. Uh, less less well-known species, things like wing-barred seed eater. This is sometimes can be localized uh, in certain areas, at least it is here in Guyana. It's also 
lives in kind of open areas near uh, in, in Amazonia along along big rivers as well. We have good chances to see to see it. And our first big mammals of the trip, the um, the Guyanan red howler monkeys. Okay, they and they are red. Uh, they are very very bright uh, and uh, they do howl. So an excellently named species. And this is one that'll join us throughout the trip um, as we sort of journey along into the interior and further afield. Speaking of the interior, once we uh, once we're done there with uh, with our time in Georgetown, we'll then take um, take a plane to Kaichur Falls. Okay, so this is uh, this is really the gem of, of Guyana. You get to see the Guyanese interior, and once you get up there, as soon as you leave the Georgetown area, all you see for miles and miles and miles around is green. Okay, you see the the flat top mountains, the tepuis in the distance. Uh, you're flying around. You might see a little snaking road or you might see a little bit of a mining operation um, but for the most part it is this huge huge swath of green and it's very humbling because you know and you're seeing it that there are still massive chunks of wilderness um, you know in an era where so much of uh, so much rainforest is being destroyed in other places so we'll meet up there with the Potaro River okay which will fly along and uh, get to the gem there, Kaichur Falls. So this place is amazing. It is the single, uh, is the highest single drop waterfall in the world, 226 meters. Um, and it's spectacular just for that, um, as you can see in the picture there. But unlike other large waterfalls, which are surrounded by casinos and development and uh, all kinds of stuff, this one is completely wild. There is an airstrip, a tiny little airstrip, uh, a few trails, but other than that, it feels remote. It feels like you're in the middle of nowhere, and that's because you are. And the bird life and animal life certainly reflects that as well. Here's a species that uh, that's an indicator of good quality uh, primary forest, good large swaths of habitat, orange-breasted falcon. Okay, Sometimes you can see them here at Kaichur. We also have the opportunity to see them at several of the lodges that we visit. Okay, so this is a species that that needs high quality forest in a lot of places other in other countries where you search for it. There's very specific uh, places to go here. We can encounter it anywhere. We can see it at Kaichur. We can see it at, at some of the lodges. Uh, we can see it along the road as we drive from lodge to lodge. And this is a sort of common theme with a lot of the birds that I'm going to be talking about uh, in the presentation. So there's not really a specific site. Um, of course, for some species there is, but for a lot of them, you can see them sort of throughout the trip. King vulture, I mean, you'll see them from the airplane um, as you're going along there. They're very common uh, in certain areas. This is another bird that needs big mammals that it could eat when they're dead and big swaths of big trees uh, for nesting and roosting. So it's a species that's pretty common and uh, spectacular. Obviously, it's a widespread bird, but it is very, very uh, easily seen here in, in Guyana. And big macaws too, you know. Again, indicator species of healthy primary forest with a large tree diversity. Of course, these things need to eat various different kinds of seeds and fruits. Um, scarlet macaw, like this one, you also get the, um, the blue and gold macaw, blue and yellow macaw, red and green macaw. Um, and they are abundant in some areas. Yeah, you'll see huge, huge flocks. You're almost never out of earshot of them. Um, it's spectacular. It, uh, it really is. Swifts, less spectacular than macaws, but still pretty cool in their own right. Uh, several species actually nest behind the falls. So you'll, if you're lucky, get to see the opportunity of these birds going in um, through the falls and actually attending their nests uh, behind the falls, which are largely unseen. Um, but it's a great place to, uh, for viewing swifts, sort of at eye level as the sort of observation area is, is high up. So you get better views than, than normal of some of these birds. But the real sort of uh, highlight, I guess, of, uh, of Kaichur and a couple other places on the tour are these uh, Guyanan cock of the rock. Okay, so this is uh, a dream bird for many and rightly so. Uh, just look at it. It's a completely crazy looking bird. It's got this amazing crest. It's bright, bright orange. Um, wild sounds. Uh, um, it's a bird that, unlike its cousin, the Andean cock of the rock, they display on or near the ground. And if you're lucky enough to see a female enter a display arena, the males, which are sitting at about eye level or maybe a little bit higher, they all flop to the ground at the same time. Uh, they find a, an area where the sun is penetrating through the canopy, where it hits them so that they glow to their brightest extent. And they do these little bounces 
competitively. Um, it's uh, a riot to watch. Um, it's uh, one of the best experiences, I think, uh, in, uh, in the country. And uh, because Kaichur is uh, a heavily visited area by tourists, I mean, this is all into perspective. You're not going to find huge crowds of people there ever. Um, but it is a place where people visit fairly frequently. So the benefit of that to us uh, as birders is that the cock of the rock here are fairly tame. They, uh, they see quite a few people, so they're not, they're not afraid. And uh, you get some nice opportunities for, for photos and views, which is always good. Slightly uh, less spectacular, but no less interesting than the cock of the rock are these little BB's rocket frogs. Um, they are endemic to uh, the Kaichur Falls area. They, they nest in these uh, terrestrial bromeliads that grow uh, along the side of the river there. So they, the mist from the falls and uh, ambient rain gets pooled into the, the leaf bases of these bromeliads. And uh, the frogs actually deposit their eggs in there and the male guards uh, the eggs and the tadpoles, which is what this one here was doing. So a fascinating little creature and uh, certainly uh, part of many highlights, big and small, uh, of, uh, of visiting this country. So what we'll do that then is uh, take our plane and we'll go off to uh, Iwakurama River Lodge, again on the Essequibo River, which is the biggest river that sort of almost cuts Guyana in half there. This lodge is amazing. This is a, a picture of it. You can see there it's situated along the side of the river and in, a, in an opening and otherwise huge primary forest. So here's another view of it. The birding is fantastic right in your yard. You know, it's, you don't have to go far at all. You can just walk out your door and there might be an ornate hawk eagle there sitting and staring at you from your room. You know, when we were there at lunch, there was a black and white hawk eagle that came by and tried to grab a, a macaw and there was a huge ruckus, um, right, you know, and we were sat down eating lunch. So <laughs> pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing. And uh, big flocks of macaws, again, this is a yard bird, you know, that they'll be going over all day pretty much. And you can, uh, you can enjoy them while, while you're eating or commuting from your room to, uh, to the bus. Um, fantastic, fantastic stuff. There's a few birds that we uh, that we search for here. We actually go out on onto the river um, one morning to uh, to check a lot of these uh, toucans, like this green arasari, which is a Guyana shield specialty. Um, we'll watch them. We have excellent views of them, of course, from the river. Uh, here's another example: a Guyana toucanet, again um, a Guyana shield specialty, and one that uh, we see quite well often along the river or elsewhere. Great potu, if you can find the bird in the picture here on the left, it looks just like a stick. This is a, a widespread species. You can find it throughout uh, South and Central America, but it's uh, quite easy to see along the river and often gives good views because it's sleeping. So very neat. Some river specialties, uh, this will be our best chance uh, to see them. Things like large build tern, uh, a widespread bird, but one that's restricted to sort of bigger rivers. Pied plover or pied lapwing is another name for it. Uh, again, a delightful little bird that we'll see on the river islands. If we're lucky, we might get a view like this of capped heron, uh, one of the most beautiful, but uh, often quite a secretive heron. Okay, often we see them flying as well. And ladder-tailed nightjar is a nightjar that often roosts um, on river islands. Um, so we see them. We actually will often stay out at dusk until dusk. So. This is, again, another cool experience. You can see the ladder tails flying around. Um, bats will be flying around. And also it gives us a good chance to look for, um, for mammals as well along the, along the side of the stream. And also the emerald tree boa, which is a, a fantastic snake. I will spare you the image of that, but, uh, but sometimes you do get lucky and see that. We'll devote actually quite a few, uh, quite a few hours uh, in the morning and over the course of the couple of days that we're there to birding in the forest as well. Birding in the forest, a little bit more challenging than birding in the river because, uh, well, just because of the, the land that you're working with, it's very dense, you're looking for mixed flocks, uh, but can be very, very rewarding. The hero here at Iwakurama is this capuchin bird. So this is a Katinga, okay? It's a, a very, very bizarre bird. The It's got a bald head that's blue. It's got these two little flaps of orange feathers on either side of its tail that it erects when it's singing. But probably the most interesting and most bizarre feature is the song. So it has this ovular sac that it inflates, which is what the bird in this picture is doing. 
uh, before it sings. And then it releases all that air and it sounds like a cow mooing. It sounds like, and they kind of tilt a little bit forward as they're doing this display. Uh, They're doing this in the canopy um, with a small group of of congeners. And uh, there is a well-known lek site here at Iwakurama that they use regularly. So um, very likely to have a a chance of uh, spotting these birds and watching them behave uh, which is uh, a huge highlight. At least for me, it was probably one of my favorite parts of uh, of the trip. And um, even if we do not see them lacking, though, we might see them attending these big bird mixed flocks. Like they'll often travel with jays and caciques. So um, if we get unlucky and we don't see them, then there's certainly opportunities to see them throughout the tour following big flocks. Inside the forest, we search for some trickier species, uh, such as ant pittas. This is spotted ant pitta. It's not a very ant pitta heavy trip. You're looking maybe at spotted and thrush like are the only two species. But white or yeah, white browed ant bird or ant birds in general are very, very diverse um, in Guyana. Okay. And what we'll be really, really hoping for is to come across uh, a big ant swarm where several species will be attending. So this is white browed. It's one of the more common ones. Uh, Rufus throated. A uh, range restricted one, spectacular bird, big blue uh, eye ring, bright rufous throat. Um, ferruginous backed ant bird. This is uh, probably one of my favorites, and, and you'll find that I say this for almost every bird in Guyana. But uh, Miramideris is an interesting genus. They walk along like little chickens following the ants, and often they're also by themselves. Um, so a really, really neat bird to see. And white plumed ant bird. So this is uh, this is one that uh, that many folks can see, many folks would love to see. Uh, It's an obligatory ant follower, okay? So it doesn't, uh, you don't really see it at all away from ant swarms. So you really do have to find a swarm uh, to see this spectacular bird. Uh, But when you do, the the vision will be ingrained in your mind forever. The crest is unbelievable. Just the color combination with the orange tail and the bluish back, uh, a fantastic, fantastic bird. And if we really get lucky and all of our stars align, uh, like they did for for us on our last trip, you might get the chance to see the rufous-winged ground cuckoo. Okay, so ground cuckoos are are these large sort of roadrunner-like birds that uh, spend their time following ants and also groups of white-licked peccaries. Okay, often you don't see them with peccaries because you just don't see peccaries very often. Uh, So most of the time when birders encounter them, um, they are following ants uh, like this one was. And uh, it is almost like a religious experience when you come across them because they're so rare, their density is so low, and there's not really a way, uh, unless there's an ant swarm that's been staked out, which is sometimes a a rare occurrence, to search specifically for these birds. You really have to sort of get lucky. But many, many people have gotten lucky with this bird uh, in Guyana. Okay, it's a very good place to see it. Just because of the habitat is so, um, there's so many areas where it could potentially be uh, it's not just one place. You can see it here at Iwakurama. You have chances at Surama Lodge or Atta Lodge or even along the road. So lots of chances to see this uh, amazing bird. And uh, when you do see it, 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 is, uh, it will stay with you forever. It's really uh, an amazing creature. So now what we'll do is we'll take the road and we'll head uh, over to another set of lodges. This is the uh, the Surama Lodge and the Atta Lodge. Okay, they're fairly similar in terms of their location. Um, and in terms of the species diversity that you see at each lodge. Each lodge does have its own sort of specialty stakeouts, um, but for the purposes of time on this talk, I'll kind of combine them. Um, The road in and of itself uh, is a birding adventure uh, and a mammal watching adventure. As you can see here, this road doesn't really go through any habitation. Every once in a while, you come across a small village, but for the most part, it goes through this wild, wild forest where a jaguar crossing the road is a very real possibility, as you can see here in this photo, but also a variety of other things. Perhaps a tapir, perhaps a sounder of white-lipped peccaries, perhaps an ant swarm, perhaps a bushmaster, which is a very large um, snake that's very difficult to see in most areas except Guyana, where it seems like a lot of people see it. Um, so the opportunities really are endless along the road, and it's certainly part of the birding adventure, uh, the drives back and forth. At bridges, if we ever, uh, when we come across bridges, we'll check for this spectacular creature, the crimson topaz. It's a hummingbird, even though it doesn't really look like a hummingbird. It's got this sort of elongate form, um, but uh, they usually fly catch over rivers, especially the males. They have um, their little territories there. So one that uh, we have lots of chances to see. 
And this is a bird that um, has recently been put on stakeout here in Guyana. The uh, here in Guyana, I mean, there in Guyana. I wish I was in Guyana. Uh, the roof is Potu. So this is the smallest of all the Potus and uh, arguably one of the most difficult to see, uh, unless of course you've got a stakeout. Um, it's a spectacular little bird. It's only about yay big, you know, and it, uh, it's very, very well camouflaged. Unlike most other potus, it roosts inside the forest. So it doesn't roost in a big open snag uh, along a river or, uh, or, you know, on a fence post like, uh, like some of the other potus do. But this one is an in interior forest bird. And to add to the difficulty in finding it, it looks just like a crumpled dead leaf to the extent that when there is a light breeze, the bird will actually move back and forth um, with the breeze and often it'll take that chance to preen uh, because otherwise it has to stay very still to in order to uh to obtain its camouflage so uh if you get the chance to see that uh, again it's a fast fascinating behavior um really really cool bird and uh certainly uh, a, a great one to see and actually this trip is fantastic for potus um long-tailed potu again sort of a less common species and often one that roosts in the woods as well um is often on stakeout and the other potu that I unfortunately don't have any pictures of is white-winged potu, okay? This is one that we search for at night. And uh, again, it's another range-restricted, sort of low-density bird that um, that doesn't occur in all, all the places, um, that doesn't occur commonly in all the places where you search for it. Uh, so in Guyana, there's a couple of stakeouts for it. And you can actually see every single potu except Northern and Andean um, on the trip, and uh, we did. So it was, uh, yeah, very good trip for potus if you're a potu lister. This is Atta Lodge. Again, it's this very sort of idyllic looking paradise with, uh, you know, fruit and hummingbird feeders. And again, it's in a clearing and this uh, beautiful forest. Uh, Sarama Lodge is a little bit different. It's sort of in an open savanna lake area, but the forest is uh, nearby as well. And so is the village. So you can hang out with the locals and chat with them, which is always very, very cool. And here we look for, we continue looking for uh, another suite of birds, okay? One of the challenges that we face is uh, finding, in finding a lot of these birds is uh, looking for flocks, okay? So a lot of birds in Guyana and elsewhere in the Neotropics will travel in these large, um, relatively fast-moving mixed flocks. And uh, one of the ones that we really, really want to pick out of this flock is these blue-backed tanagers, Okay. Um, they are incredible. They're very large for a tanager. Um, they're quite loud, um, but they're very low density. So we have to really hit the field hard to try and find them in a flock. We were lucky and we, we hit a, a big flock with six or seven individuals and they are just, the colors are incredible. Um, this is a female here in this picture. The male is even brighter blue on top. Uh, they have this really big, thick bill, almost like a crow. Um, just a, a fantastic, fantastic bird and quite range restricted. Uh, not very many places to see this, basically just Guyana here in Brazil. Um, Jacamars, again, if you like Jacamars, very Jacamar heavy trip. This is one of the most beautiful, at least to my eyes, the Paradise Jacamar. And, uh, oop, the, uh, <laughs> it's not a Budio Gallus. I'm sorry, the uh, scientific name there is wrong. Um, <laughs> The great Jacamar uh, is uh, one of the largest of the Jacamars, and uh, it's another indicator of, uh, of primary forest. It is common in Guyana. You'll, you're almost never within outside of earshot, especially in the morning, uh, of, these, uh, of these lovely Jacamars. And you also get yellow-billed Jacamar, uh, bronzy Jacamar in the white sand forest, um, and uh, green-tailed Jacamar, and even rufous-tailed Jacamar. Uh, spotted puffbird is a, sort of the default puffbird um, in this area. It's very attractive, as you can see in this photo, often by itself and sometimes in with the flocks. But one of the birds that I think everybody is hoping for uh, on a trip to Guyana or anywhere else in its range is the harpy eagle. And we have this unique scenario in Guyana where there are a couple of nests that are staked out. Um, if you get lucky, there may be birds attending the nest or if the young is uh, very large and has left the nest, sometimes they sort of hang around. But there is also ample chances to see one of these birds just out of the blue. There might be one bathing in a roadside puddle as we commute from one lodge to the next. You might be eating breakfast at, uh, at a lodge and one flies through the opening. Um, they are... They can be anywhere. The habitat is so good. And uh, at least to me, 
Uh, going to a, a nest stakeout is cool. You know, you can't uh, you can't deny that. Uh, but it seems almost orchestrated. You know, you show up and the bird's there. Whereas here, you might be driving along and you stop and you hey, oh, what's that sitting in the cecropia? And oh, it's a harpy eagle. Um, so that sort of uh, adrenaline rush is is definitely worth it, and uh, something that's uh, quite unique to to this trip, where it can happen at any point in time, pretty much. Uh, slightly less uh, exciting than the than the harpy eagle. We've got uh, this little bird here, but the reason I, I added him here is for the for, well for the for the intense birders, but also um, just for the possibility of finding uh, new things in in Guyana. So this is Pelzen's toady tyrant. Um, it's it was endemic to Brazil very recently. Uh, it was discovered in Guyana, very close to Atta Lodge in a section of white sand forest. So another opportunity to see it and another excellent bird to add to the list uh, on our Guyana trip. Um, but this is probably a case that's going to repeat itself over and over as Guyana becomes more uh, visited by birding guides and more covered uh, by, uh, by experts as well. There's a lot of places that are uh, they're not very well covered by birders or, or biologists or ornithologists at all. So uh, it's definitely holding a few surprises, I think, still. And you can't talk about Guyana without talking about Katingas, okay? And I know I've reserved the Katingas for this section of the talk, but just like most of the other birds I've chatted about, uh, you can come across these birds throughout the trip, okay? There's not really one specific area where you look for them, but just look at this spangled Katinga. Who does not want to see one of those? Just a spectacular, spectacular bird, a shining beacon of blue and purple in the canopy. Um, this pompadour Katinga, just as ridiculously colored, it's got this amazing wine color, the wings are white, the eye is bright white, and uh, just, a, just a spectacular bird, and another one that's fairly common, you know, you can come across uh, flocks of them or individuals uh, in fruiting trees, even along the road, or in the front yard at, at a lodge, uh, just uh, spectacular, and they just keep getting better and better. Uh, the uh, Guyana and Red Katinga, again, it's a Guyana Shield uh, specialty, spectacular mix of colors there. I love that brown and, and, and red mix. But when talking about red, really the buck stops here at the Crimson Fruit Crow. Okay, that is a red unlike any other. And this is a, a very special bird in Guyana, I think is probably with the exception of maybe a couple of sites uh, around Manaus in Brazil, the best place to see it uh, in the world. Okay, in Guyana, you could see it in many, many different places. Um, and as you can see here, it's a big bird. It's very bright, um, very spectacular, and uh, just a, a special, special bird that we search for. Now, I know a lot of folks don't like snakes. We just talked about colorful Katingas, so I feel like I should add the obligatory snakes right after that. But if you just look at this creature, it's, it's hard not to fall in love with it. It's a Western rainbow boa. And true to its name, it has this unbroken tract of iridescence from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail, it does look uh, like a rainbow. You know, as this animal moves around, and of course the picture doesn't do it justice, but as this animal moves around, you can see this glowing sort of iridescence moving around on it. Um, it's got these big orange eye spots, uh, just a fantastic, fantastic beast. And uh, we were lucky, this is a species that spends a lot of time in the canopy. We saw it because there was a bunch of army ants that were going up a tree and this was a young one. So I guess it wasn't very high up in the tree and it actually fell down onto the trail and uh, we got to see it. So uh, for me, uh, a naturalist who really enjoys looking for snakes and seeing snakes, uh, Guyana is a, is a great spot. Um, for those who are worried about snakes, you essentially don't encounter snakes in the neotropics unless of course there's one crossing the road unless you're specifically looking for them. Okay, they're very, very difficult to encounter. They do their best to, to hide from humans. This one uh, didn't uh, didn't work well enough, and I still uh, I still found it and picked it up. You can see there's some blood on me there. Um, it's a vine snake. It 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 did bite me just because I was handling it, but it's uh, it really needs to bite you hard in order to envenomate you, and the venom is quite weak. So um, a lot of folks were really happy to see it up close. It's just a, a fantastic animal, bright green really uh, spiffy looking with the big nose. It's a lizard specialist. It eats uh, lizards mostly at night when they're sleeping. Um, so humans have nothing to worry about. And I uh, just, uh, just wanted to share because I think they're just so cool. So night birding, um, fairly productive here in Guyana. Lots of different stuff, things to see. You can do it just in the yard. There's no, uh, there's no long drives. Uh, Tawny-bellied screech owl is sort of a staple. 
less common uh, black banded owl. There's a couple of spots where uh, we'll try for this owl. It's a big, fairly big owl. And uh, just like on any nocturnal adventure, um, anything is possible. So an ocelot, um, margay, maybe a jaguarundi, even though they're most active during the day, or any any other surprises. Uh, night nighttime excursions are also are always very fun. So especially here in this sort of mega diverse country. So after we're we're done at those two lodges, we're gonna we're gonna head to another spot, uh, the Rupununi Savanna. Okay, and this is an area that's uh, that's very different from the areas that we've been exploring so far. Okay, this is what it looks like, um, almost reminiscent of uh, of Africa, right? These big plains, uh, lots of grass, no giraffes or zebras or anything like that, um, but a very unique set of animals uh, in its own right. Okay. There's these big wetlands as well that we'll stop at and we'll have a, a look for a new suite of birds. One of them is the Jabiru, a widespread species, but uh, one that uh, is beautiful and exciting to see wherever it is. Uh, one that's harder to see, but one that we have very good luck with here is the pinnated bittern. Okay, this is uh, like all bitterns, well, I should say most bitterns, a uh, fairly secretive bird, uh, but in the early morning, sometimes they're out patrolling the edges of fields uh, or marshes, so we have a good chance of connecting with that. And sharp-tailed ibis, this is one that's not very common in Guyana, and there's a couple of spots to see it. Uh, it's a spectacular bird, it's very large, uh, it's got those skin flaps of uh, different colors around its face, so always a, a neat, neat bird to see. And burrowing owls, again, very sort of common, commonplace uh, in drier areas, so, some place you sort of drive along, and it seems like there's one on every single fence post. Aplomato falcon. This is a bird that uh, that is widespread through South America. It uses different habitats. Uh, here it's quite common and uh, we'll probably see several pairs, sometimes on nice perches low on fence posts. And uh, sort of the savanna creature, savanna big mammal here is uh, the giant anteater. So this is one that um, we often have uh, local folks and scientists who are working with them help us out uh, in terms of finding them. Uh, this is one sort of on uh, on a hillside far away, but if you're very lucky, you might get to see it up close like this. And it is just uh, a fantastic creature. Um, you have to see one of these uh, in your life. It's just, uh, it's so bizarre. You know, the, the long tubular snout, of course, uh, adapted for sucking up termites, uh, huge front claws. Um, a big, big animal, but sometimes if you're lucky, you might see one with a baby and the baby actually rides on the back of the mom. So it, uh, it just looks like a cartoon character. Uh, fantastic, fantastic uh, thing to see and uh, something that we get pretty much on every trip. Uh, for smaller, uh, more sort of uh, duller, but just as sought after birds. This is actually one of my favorite birds in South America, the bearded tachuri. So this is a female. The male does have a, a bit more of a, of a beard, but it, it's not like a huge beard. It's just some gray streaks. Uh, but this is one that's uh, imperiled. Uh, it needs uh, high quality grasslands and wetlands uh, in order to, uh, to proliferate. And it's very spotily distributed um, in South America. So it's always a, a neat one to see. Um, and there's also the crested doradito, which we uh, which we look for in the wetlands around here as well. We'll take a ride on a river uh, once again, uh, the Rupununi River, where we have chances, very good chances, of seeing this lovely creature, the agami heron, um, another bird that's widespread but never really super easy to see uh, throughout its range, unless of course you visit a nesting colony. Here we have the opportunity to see several of them. They become active at dusk, okay? So we'll go out in the river at about that time uh, to increase our chances in seeing it. And if we get really lucky, then we might come across this enchanting little creature, not as spectacularly colored as the agami, but uh, it makes up for that in its rarity and just its whimsicalness. Uh, the zigzag heron, a tiny, tiny little heron, uh, mostly nocturnal, but it has been seen here on a few occasions. So if we get lucky, we might come across it. And another big mammal highlight are these giant river otters over a meter long. Of course, this is the, um, in the Pantanal and things are, this is sort of places where they're famous for, but they are here also in Guyana. And uh, our trip on the Rupununi River gives us a very good chance. Uh, we visit an oxbow lake, which is where uh, they like to hang out. This is a picture of it. So even if uh, the otters aren't there at the time, 
Um, we'll stay until dusk and uh, see a, a fantastic natural uh, phenomenon where these big water lilies that you see there in the photo, their big purple and white flowers open up as it starts to get dark. They're pollinated mostly by beetles. And um, as this is happening, you know, there's all these birds calling. There might be potus starting to call. These band-tailed night hawks will be flying all over the, uh, and drinking all over the Oxbow Lake. And it's just a, a fantastic combination of, of stuff to see um, as it's getting dark. And again, this is one of those pristine areas too. You know, there's no traffic noise um, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. It really is. So, as, uh, as we sort of complete our, uh, air, our um, surveys there and our, our birding around the Rupununi area, we have a couple of target species that, uh, that are sort of one-off targets that require long drives to get to. Okay, but it's very worth it when we get to them. So this is one of the places that we visit. It's a village called Corasabai, close to the Brazilian border. Okay, and our main goal, even though there's, there's lots of other birds here that, that we're, we're going to see, some some repetitive and some a couple of new species but the ones that we're really looking to get are uh, these sun parakeets okay they're also called sun conure um, if you're familiar with them from the cage bird trade they were at one point very very popular and still are uh, and that's one of the reasons uh, why they've become so endangered okay so Karasabai is probably or certainly the best place in the world to see them uh, they're rebounding a little bit in brazil now too but uh on our past trip there, we got very lucky and we were actually approached by them and they came right up to us and uh, just a fantastically colored bird. Um, a great named, great named bird because they do look like the sun. They've got this bright orange on the face that kind of turns to yellow. And uh, yeah, a very, very special, um, you know, moment to be able to, to get into the, the habitat uh, of these birds, which is quite remote and to sort of see them behaving um, as they would in the wild because they are in the wild. Another bird that we seek, I don't have a map just because this one is uh, even more um, threatened by poaching, the red siskin. Okay, so red siskins are mostly found in Venezuela. This population in Guyana was relatively recently discovered, and this is a species that's imperiled uh, due to poaching, just like the sun parakeet. Uh, if you're familiar with the pet store canaries that you see, um, Canaries, of course, are, are yellow, like the, the standard Atlantic canary from which all those canaries originated uh, is yellow or yellowish brown. So in order to get those red factor canaries or those orange canaries, you have to crossbreed them with, uh, with the red siskin. So that's why, um, especially earlier on when the canary craze was uh, at its peak, there were many, many hundreds and hundreds and thousands uh, of these imported uh, from Venezuela and their population suffered gravely as a result. So lucky to have this little population in Guyana that we can visit and see. Uh, it's a long drive, a very, very interesting drive uh, with many different, uh, you know, possibilities to see other species along the way. But when you finally lay eyes on this, uh, on this precious little creature, uh, it all becomes worth it. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a fantastic bird, just like every other bird I've, I've been talking about. <laughs> so uh, last but not least, uh, we visit uh, the town of Lethem. This is a, a fairly uh, well-developed uh, town right on the Brazilian border, um, sort of borders with Bomfim there, which is another big town um, in Brazil. And here again, we're looking for a couple of uh, a couple of target birds. So a, we visit the Irang River, which is a tributary of a tributary of the Rio Branco, okay, which is uh, holds a couple of endemics. One of them is this, the hoary-throated spinetail. This bird is critically endangered. Uh, it's found mostly in Brazil, where the majority of its habitat has been destroyed. So the Orang River provides this unique uh, area where there's still some pristine habitat left. Uh, they're quite common um, in some areas. You just kind of have to get to where they are and, uh, you know, excellent chances of seeing them. And also another critically endangered bird that's endemic to the same area that the spine tails are, the Rio Branco ant bird. Okay, so again, very confiding and uh, relatively common. Once you get to where they are, they're just found in, in a very small area. So once we uh, once we see those two species, we'll head uh, we'll head back to to Latham there. We'll do some birding around uh, around the river there. We might clean up some species that we haven't seen elsewhere. A little chachalaca uh, and stuff like that is uh, maybe some new stuff. But then from there, uh, we'll take our flight uh, back to Georgetown. Pretty pretty easy flight, and we'll conclude the tour there. So, um, hopefully, in the past. Uh, 
50 minutes or so, I was uh, able to show you just a little chunk uh, of, uh, of the amazing country that Guyana is. Um, from amazing big mammals to fantastic scenery to big and uh, attractive birds to many, many endemics and uh, of course the Guyanan cock of the rock. Uh, it really has something to offer everybody from the mammal watchers to the intense birders and everyone in between. So thank you very much for listening uh, and also thank you very much to the photographers that contributed uh, their photos. Uh, most of the photos are, are my own but also I needed uh, uh, some help from, from these kind folks. Uh, some of whom I may have forgotten, and if, if so, uh, I apologize. But uh, yes, thank you very much, and uh, thank you everybody for watching. Liv, absolutely fantastic. Wow. Yeah, look, I, I knew that Guyana was always high on my list, but that's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty extraordinary place. And, and I think, you know, your, I mean, the quality of the photos are fantastic, but I think your enthusiasm and delivering your passion for this country uh, just takes it to, to another level. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, no, I love it. It's, uh, it's, it's great. Anytime you get to explore like uh, a massive, you know, you, you know, you're just like a little dot in this green sea. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just great to me. Yeah, I, I think that's it. It's, it's being surrounded by that volume of untouched wilderness and habitat and uh it's it's got to be got to be incredibly special it sort of reminds me a little bit you know when you're talking about it of places like gabon in africa or bhutan in in asia uh where you've got these little slices of of what what originally was around you know that just haven't been influenced uh to such a degree by humans so yeah just just a wonderful presentation thank you so much lev thank you so much um, so yeah, there's a Q and A coming up as well. Thanks so much for for the questions that we've got in already. Um, yeah, Nikki's going to be be chatting with Lev shortly, and and you'll get some answers to those. And uh, yeah, pick Lev's brain a little bit more there on that front. Um, but yeah, just just to let you know that um, we'll be back again next week. So I know you guys have got into a, a routine of uh, joining us every two weeks for our for our webinars this year. Uh, but we're going to have one next week as well. And um, it's going to be Dushan. Dushan's going to be uh, Dushan Brinkhazen uh, will be our guest speaker. And he's going to be taking us to one of his favorite locations in Ecuador. So he's actually based in Quito, Ecuador, um, and has been for the last decade. Uh, but he's going to take us through the uh, Choco Forest Zone, a very, very special part um, of Ecuador and, and a real biodiversity hotspot. Um, it actually holds the largest number of restricted range birds of any endemic bird area in the Americas. Um, 62 species being endemic just to just to that zone so a pretty incredible place um, so yeah do join us for that he's going to showcase some of the the real avian wonders of the region uh, from long wattled umbrella birds and rufous crowned and giant anpitters and mossback tanagers indigo flower piercers and star-chested tree runners there's there's a whole load of fantastic birds out there and, and loads more obviously it's also arguably the best zone in the world to try and find the unique sapayoa uh, which is obviously a, a monotypic um, family and something quite unique, uh, particularly for family listers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's arguably the best place uh, currently to, to try and actually see that particular species. Anyway, that's, that's Dushan coming up next week. Um, and then just a reminder as well, the webinars are always recorded, so you can always view them later on. And uh, we'll send you guys the links as well, uh, because you've signed up for the, for the webinar itself. And um, yeah, just, just a reminder as well, we're, we're obviously running a, a few tours now through the US, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. So some of our US-based leaders um, are getting out into the field and, and some of the folks uh, who are joining us from the US have an opportunity to, to travel around, around your country and, and potentially join us on a trip as well. But um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of uh, countries are still closed and a lot of our leaders are stuck uh, back home still. And, itching to get out to, to some of these exotic parts of the world with you all, uh, as I'm sure you are as well. Um, but yeah, GoFundMe is still, is still open. So um, yeah, if you do wish to donate, um, that, uh, that link is still open. Um, but yeah, on that note, it's uh, over to Nikki and Lev for some Q&A. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Keith. And Lev, thank you so much. It just great information and, and such a lovely presentation as well. Um, Deborah also echoes that there's great presentation. Um, please address the danger level and diff difficulty. 
Um, sure. So in terms of difficulty, um, there's not very, there's some hiking involved. Uh, there's at least a couple of hikes that have an uphill component. Um, like in many places in South America, it could be like, if it's raining, it could be a little bit slippery. Um, I would say it's fairly similar to, to most other tours in the fact that you're not really walking, uh, for more than two or three kilometers sort of at a time. Um, always sort of in shaded areas in the Rupununi Savannah where it's a bit hotter. We don't spend too, too much time hiking, um, but we always are, are conscious of the heat and of course the weather. Um, there's one hike uh, at Iwakurama to Turtle Mountain that's a little bit more challenging um, in terms of, uh, you know, you're out there for four or five hours, you're going up sort of a slope. Uh, so that's really the only thing I can think of that uh, might be a, a challenge in order um, to walk. Uh, but also, like, there's a lot of roadside birding. There's a lot of, um, you know, stopping and going in, in the vehicles and, and whatnot. So overall, it's it's fairly easy. Um, in terms of dangers, um, I'm not sure what sort of dangers uh, you might be thinking of specifically. Um, some mosquito-borne illness, illnesses, I think there is an advisory for malaria. So if you have, uh, if you take uh, malaria medication, I recommend uh, taking that, um, as the, I think the, there's a lot of advisories. The U.S. and Canada, I know they have uh, advisories for that in terms of uh, in terms of that sort of medication. Uh, yellow fever, I think, might be a good idea. But yeah, in terms of uh, danger at the airport, like it's not it's not particularly dangerous. It's not any more dangerous than anywhere else, really. So um, yeah. I uh, oh. can't think of any other dangers off the bat. Um, insects, there's some biting insects. It's not, uh, you know, we don't tend to go during the rainy season when the roads are all washed out and the, the biting insects are at their peak. So, yeah. Thanks, Rev. And then Gabriel is saying, are there any nemesis birds uh, still for you over in Guiana? There, there are, there are. So uh, unfortunately, when, uh, when on my last visit there, we could not connect with the crimson fruit crow. And we tried and tried and tried. We spent many, many hours, you, you know, in, in good habitat, which is everywhere. Uh, but it's still, it's still, it would not materialize. We had everything. We had purple breasted Katinga. We had, you know, tons of pompadour Katingas, you know, um, Guyane and red Katingas all over the place, but we could just not get this, this fruit crow. It, uh, it slipped away. And uh, a couple of days after I had come back on the tour, uh, one of the folks who was working at uh, one of the lodges that I was uh, sort of kept in touch with. So she mentioned that they had a fruit crow uh, very, very soon after our group had, had left. So in a, in a classic nemesis bird fashion, um, it showed up just after we, we had gone. So that's, uh, that's my one big nemesis bird uh, for Guyana. And um, Karen's asking, how many days is the tour and what time of the year is best? Uh, maybe Keith, uh, can I can hand it over to Keith for that. Um, I'm not sure what the current dates are planned. I know uh, we had a, a November date was when, when I went. Yeah, so yeah, November is a, is a very good time of the year. So is December as well. Um, we've also occasionally done the trip through sort of January and February. Um, but I know next year offhand, the November dates are already sold out. So we've actually got a, um, a second set of dates that we've put in. And I think they're in October, but I'll just double check that um, just quickly. Well, while Keith is looking Will for you? that, um, I'll, what I'll is a great field guide uh, for the area? Um, which one do you recommend? Um, there, so there's not really a field guide specifically for Guyana, um, as, as far as I'm aware. Um, the field guide I use, I can dig it out here, is this one, the uh, Birds of Northern South America. Okay, so it's a, it's a big area and uh, it's a fairly recent field guide, so it's all uh, it's all up to date. There's a Birds of Suriname, I believe, um, which I think is a little bit out of date nowadays. Um, but yeah, so it's the uh, Robin Restall Birds of Northern South America. It's uh, it's not particularly gigantic, like it, it's not quite as big as you would think it would be. Um, but that's uh, that's the one that I've uh, that I've been using when I was there. So and you get a, a few other countries in there as well. Brilliant. 
Margaret's saying uh, com comfort level um, at the lodges. Um, she also understands that power is often intermittent. Yes. So um, with, as with any uh, lodges located in extremely remote areas, they do run on generators. So uh, it seems to change sort of every time. So they, they might have what they usually have is they'll have power on sort of in the evening. Uh, so you can charge your equipment uh, or have the fan on when you're when you're going to sleep at night. It's relatively pleasant. The the sleeping temperature, uh, the lodges are, you know, the the beds and the food is are very good. They're very high standard, uh, so it's quite comfy. Yeah, it's quite comfy at uh, at all the lodges there. Any chance for skimmers? Skimmers. Um, there are chances for skimmers. Yep, on the river, especially in the uh, in the uh, Iwakurama River Lodge, uh, there there may be uh, there may be skimmers. They're not particularly common. They like uh, uh, big bigger rivers, but you do see them uh, along um, well, the Esquibo. Yeah, you do see them along there, and in that uh, area where Iwakurama is located, you might uh, you might get some there. Brenda's saying any type of bulbirds. Yes, so um, the bellbird that's endemic to the Guiana Shield and that's found in Guyana is the white bellbird. Uh, the problem with this bird is that it is vocal during the rainy season, which is when uh, usually when we're not there um, because travel is very hard. You know, the roads get all watered down, they're dirt roads. Um, so it is, is, it is hard to see when it's not singing. Um, every once in a while, you might get very lucky and you see some individuals at a fruiting tree. Um, but they are hard to see. They're not, uh, they're not easy to get, unfortunately. But what? yes, it's the, it's the white bellbird. Yep. Oh, thanks, Liv. What's your typical bird, uh, your trip bird list? So the trip, uh, trip list, you're looking at 450 to 500 species, sort of in that, in that ballpark. Now, now Tristan um, is saying thank you for the fantastic talk, Liv. Um, they, they also enjoy snakes and amphibians. And, um, you know, nice. we, we can expect some herbing as, as well from other guides in Guiana. Um, what, and in particular with the birds, what's the success rate for seeing a harpy eagle? Um, so the success rate for harpy eagle is very much dependent on whether or not there is a stakeout nest. So at Atta Lodge, especially around that area, there's a couple of nests. Um, but because harpy eagles take a long time to fledge, um, when the bird is there and it's young, um, it's sort of always there, right? And uh, that might be for several months. Um, and it, because they take, you know, over a year to, to leave, they, um, the, time, the timing can be hard to plan, right? Uh, so there's not like a particular uh, month where we know for sure it's going to be there. Um, but when they are there, the chance is obviously very good. Um, in terms of finding one sort of randomly uh, on our travels, uh, the chances are also fairly good. Um, we did not see one, unfortunately. We were, spent a lot of time uh, at the nest at our, at our last trip and we did not see one. Um, but uh, when they're there, they're, they're sort of always there. Um, if you're looking for that specifically on the Guyana trip, uh, it would be wise to sort of drop us a line and then we can uh, find out what the status is in terms of stakeouts. Oh, great. So, but you know, it's it's in terms of yeah, randomly coming across one, the chances are still uh, pretty good. But as yeah. as with any large raptor, you sort of have to be at the right place at the right time. Absolutely. A um, couple of questions on humidity. How uh, how hot and humid are the nights, and do you struggle to sleep? I can I can understand this question. Ah <laughs> uh, yes, that uh, that is a very good question. Uh, it's quite humid, uh, but it's not. Uh, at night, especially, it's not uh, sort of debilitatingly hot. Uh, it's comfortable to sleep. There's uh, there's fans um, that uh, that keep air circulating there. Uh, so I, you know, I didn't receive any complaints from from any of the guests or or myself. I found that the lodges were generally very comfortable to sleep uh, at night, um, and it's not uh, not particularly hot. Um, during the day, uh, it can get hot in the forest. It's kind of mediated by the shade. Uh, but for example, in the savanna or sometimes out on the river um, in the middle of the day can get, you know, high 20s, low, low 30s. And what's the food like? Um, so I, I wouldn't say that uh, 
that Guyana is necessarily like a culinary destination. Um, it's relatively basic. Most of the food you're going to find uh, in Georgetown. The lodges do a good job. They know they, they're catering to, uh, to tourists. So they do their best in terms of, um, you know, prepping tasty food for us. The availability of ingredients, uh, as you can imagine, in the middle of nowhere um, is is very low so they're they're limited on what they can get from uh from town um so the food is definitely quite good uh it's not five star you know uh lobster or anything like that but it's you know it's basic south america food so a lot of rice uh, a lot of uh chicken and beef and things like that um so yeah quite good but not not fancy as is, to be expected for a remote yeah. area is malaria a problem um, so I, I'm not sure what the status, what the current status of, uh, of the malaria is down there. I know there's, uh, there's warnings that uh, I know the Canadian government and the U.S. government um, in a travel advisory um, for, for malaria. I don't know, Keith, if you know any, anything more recent, uh, more recent than that. Um, a lot of hand live. Yeah, it's, uh, so I, it's definitely there. Um, it's, it's something that uh, in any sort of lowland South American country that you have to deal with, it's a personal preference. Some folks, you know, like to bring the malaria medication. Some are willing to take the risk. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely there. So um, keep that in mind for, uh, for, for travel. In terms of uh, mosquito exposure in the lodges, they all have insect nets and mosquito nets that you can use. Um, and generally, at least when, when we were there, we sort of tend to go in the dry season where the biting insects are not really a noticeable problem. Sometimes when you get, you know, in the middle of the day near the water, there's a few kind of going around, but it's never like this overwhelming as you would get in the rainy season. Oh, thanks. Uh, Suran is saying your presentation was excellent, Liv. I hope to see you in Guyana in 2023. Um, and um, she really looks forward to meeting you in person. So thank you, Sarah. Great. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to getting out there too. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, very much looking forward to getting back uh, on, the, on the birds. So um, I can't remember if we've mentioned this, but Margaret um, just asked, uh, what are the vehicles like that will be used? So we use uh, big Land Rover type uh, four by four vehicles. Um, they have air conditioning. So uh, they're quite comfy. You know, we, the windows will go down. Uh, the road is pretty dusty. So a lot of the time we'll be driving uh, with the windows up. Um, what we do when we drive, especially for longer stretches of time is we, um, we stop periodically and the lead car will change so that everybody has a, a chance to be up at the front where it's less dusty and you know, more likely to see something if it bolts across the road. Um, but that being said, when we sort of commute, we, we don't just fly down the road. You know, we go slow uh, and listen every once in a while to look uh, for mammals or birds along the way. Because as you saw there in that picture, it's all excellent habitat. So the birding from the road uh, can be very good. What's uh, Ju Judith is asking, what's the chance of seeing a trumpeter? Yes, uh, very good, very good. So uh, gray-winged trumpeters, the one that you see there, and um, like many of the birds, they're present all over the place. You can see them, uh, usually when we see them, it's early in the morning uh, along trails or even along the road uh, in, little, in little groups. So yes, chances are very good for a gray-winged trumpeter. Are there any orchards in the, the forest? Orchards in terms of... Um, uh, Bromley or orchids. Orchids. Oh, sorry. Or or orchids. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. I thought you said orchid. Yeah. Sorry, Nikki. Sorry, I misunderstood you. I misunderstood you. Yes, uh, orchid diversity uh, is fairly high. It's not quite as high as some montane sites. It's usually um, like when you get up into the Andes, or if there's any sort of contour, um, that's when orchid diversity tends to tends to increase, uh, at least in South America. But uh, yes, there there are m many bromeliads, uh, many species of orchids. I'm unfortunately. I'm a fan of orchids and I love to, to look for them, but I don't know too, too much about them. Um, so that's something that I'm still learning about. Um, but yes, from what I've heard from other folks that are interested in orchids, um, the Guyana Shield, uh, I'm guessing the Tepui region too, has uh, quite, a, quite a few, quite a lot. I'm guessing Great. many endemics too. Linda is saying, are they bats? 
bats. Yes, there are. Um, we saw a few species of bats. Um, the there are no bats that uh, that are likely to feed on humans. Uh, if, if that's sort of the direction the question was going, but otherwise, yeah, bat diversity is is quite high. Um, you don't really see them <laughs> because uh, you know they're just hard to see. But occasionally at dusk, yeah, you might see um, a few. We found a little roost of um, dog-faced bats, which are um, I wanted to put a picture in there, but they look kind of creepy. Um, but yeah, they're they're little, they do have like a, a dog-like sort of pointy snout. Yeah, they're very small. And uh, yeah, so we, we found a roost of those uh, under a rock, like a big <laughs> opening. So, so yeah, if you're a bat enthusiast, uh, definitely chances to see bats. Uh, if you're afraid of bats biting you, uh, very, very unlikely. Oh, brilliant. Good to know. Um, and then Brenda's saying, any chance of seeing long wattled umbrella birds? Uh, no. So a uh, long wattled umbrella bird is, um, is a choco endemic, right? So that's one that you'll see uh, in Colombia and Ecuador. Um, but not uh, not out here, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I think the confusion uh, came in because I was I was talking about long wattled umbrella birds and with uh, with Dushan's talk next week. <laughs> so that one we'll we'll save for the for the choco yeah next week. Thanks, Brenda. And Maria is saying fabulous presentation. Thank you. Is it possible to add a Suriname on at the end of one of your trips? Uh, it's certainly possible. Yeah. You'll have to uh, get in touch with uh, with our tailor made department, but uh, yeah, it is uh, it is definitely possible. Great. Um, uh, this one's an inter interesting uh, one. What do you do about luggage given um, the chartered flight uh, to the falls? That is a very good question, and uh, the answer is um, the drivers that we're going to be using uh, that are going to be helping us out um, throughout the trip. They're actually going to take a portion of, uh, of the luggage, they're going to strap it onto their vehicles, and they're actually going to drive to Kaichua Falls. It's a very, very long drive, um, so we're not going to be subjected to that, but uh, they, they're going to be our heroes. They're going to take some of our luggage, and they're going to meet us uh, at Iwakurama Lodge with it. Oh, yeah, because there's a luggage. Uh, it's a small airplane. Yeah, there's a luggage. Uh, and what's the word I'm looking for? Restriction. Um, but yes, yeah, they'll... Uh, they will uh, get your luggage there to Iwakrama. Yes, that's a good question. I didn't, uh, didn't uh, mention that. So Ricky's also got a lovely question here and, and, and a, an important question to ask. In such a currently pristine area, do visits by birding groups help protect the areas? Example, by supporting local community investment in preservation, or do we encourage development encroachment on those pristine areas? That is a very good question. And... Um, that's certainly, you know, something that needs a, a study to really know the, the answer of. Uh, but in my personal opinion, um, I think the attraction for birders uh, coming to these areas are these vast wildernesses, um, right? Like the stuff that we want to see uh, needs this sort of habitat to survive. And I think uh, that especially uh, in this case, where a lot of the lodges are being run by uh, like local indigenous communities, um, tourism is encouraging these folks to uh, to conduct conservation uh, around their communities and with the lodge. They know it's a, it's a very uh, valuable resource to them because it's a lot of money coming in from birding and other general nature uh, groups coming uh, to, to use the facilities there. So it sort of uh, hammers this down this fact where, that these natural resources are, uh, are valuable, right? And they need to be protected. So I think birding and other sorts of tourism to these lodges in this area is very net positive um, for all these animals. The biggest threat that um, that this sort of uh, habitat faces is mining, unfortunately. And that's, uh, again, a growing uh, threat to, to places like this all over the world. And uh, that's certainly, besides, you know, being politically active, not something birders can do much about. And also we contribute, uh, we have the rock jumper conservation fund, which we collect and up until uh, 2019, uh, for the past two years, we had um, donated about $400,000 to conservation initiatives that we are very passionate about, and, and it's our core value, which is protecting biodiversity, which is so important. Um, uh, Pat is saying, what's the tour like for hummingbirds, and what are the chances of seeing the topaz? That's a very good question. 
Um, it is uh, not, uh, admittedly, it's not a very hummingbird heavy tour. There are a, a handful of species, but uh, generally sort of low, lowlands are not particularly um, diverse areas for, for hummingbirds. They just sort of like some, some gradient there for there to be diversity. But that being said, there are some fantastic species and the topaz is certainly one of them. So believe it or not, the topaz actually comes to feeders at, uh, at, at a lodge. So you can have breakfast and be watching the, the topazes coming to the feeders. Most of the time they're, they're young males or, or females, but uh, the, the adult males we'll search for uh, along the main road. There's these little bridges that often go over tiny creeks and there's often a territorial male there. So the chances are very good. The chances are very good. Um, Jeffrey asks uh, such an important question for us now um, in, in the world that we're living. What is the current and future COVID travel uh, situation in Guyana? So from what I understand at the moment, and of course this is something that's changing uh, rapidly on a, on a daily, on a daily uh, basis, I think, in, in a lot of places, um, I think Guyana is taking tourists. Um, I'm not sure about the, the quarantine requirements or, or anything of that nature. I'm not sure, Keith, if, if you'd be up to, up to speed on that or, or not. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there, there's definitely tourism. Like I was looking at the, uh, the lodge web pages the other day and they, they did mention that they were taking tourists. So uh, in terms of uh, COVID itself in Guyana, I, I don't think it's, it's worse than... Um, than sort of the the worst places i think it's fairly moderate or or uh kind of not not spectacularly good or bad um from just from my very small amount of research that that i've done um but uh but yeah that's definitely something that uh yeah. that so i need to look at to, to give you a straight uh, yeah. straight answer about from the office's perspective it's something that we keep our eye on and we watch hourly and daily and we communicate with our our guests that are booking whether it's safe or not to enter into specific countries and and we have either postponed or or gone ahead with the tour but we make sure that we we keep um, our finger on that pulse for you yeah. and communicate in a timely way and making sure we have things like flexible booking terms and 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 help really helping us during this period um, Absolutely. Um, just, just, just to add a couple of things in there, as as they've said, Ghana is actually uh, is open at the moment uh, to most people who who travel. You need to provide a negative PCR test. Um, we'd need to check on the exact quarantine requirements, but I don't believe there is any uh, at the moment. And Guyana currently, well, they're pushing towards fifteen percent of their population uh, vaccinated, so they they they're making some headway there as well. Um, Thanks, guys. Very last question. Um, a bit of a um, difficult one. Uh, is Has Guyana been impacted by the Venezuelan refugees at all, um, based on your um, knowledge? So I am obviously not, uh, not an expert. Um, from what I've gathered from just speaking to folks in Georgetown when I was there. Uh, there's definitely uh, quite a few Venezuelan refugees uh, that are there. How that is impacting uh, anything there, like in terms of economy or, or political stuff, I, I don't know. Uh, I know, um, like many countries that are bordering Venezuela, uh, they, are, they are taking, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of folks who are, um, you know, emigrating from Venezuela into many other countries. Um, Guyana, I don't think is particularly attractive just because of, uh, it's not, in terms of opportunities, there's not much to do there. It's a very limited population in a small, very small area. Um, but uh, that's pretty much all, all I know. I know that there are Venezuelan refugees there. Um, how, how that's impacting anything or what the quantity is or or, or yeah. what i uh, i don't for sure mary's actually responded and she said um there is an influx um but it's not overwhelming thank you so much mary for for sharing that with us yeah thank you um, and that is the end of our uh, q a thank you so much um from all of us uh, on the at the uh, rock jumper team thank you lev uh, thank you for everyone to for joining us uh, today and we can't wait to see you next week Cheers from all of us. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Thank bye you. everyone. Bye.